Over the past 10 or so years, there has been a fair amount of speculation on the internet regarding the subject of cults operating within online games. Talks of games having secretive underground cults, using them for recruitment and going about their culty business behind the scenes, all the while remaining unnoticed by moderators and the general player base. I myself have been interested in these rumors since they first started getting traction, but I never really looked into them that much beyond, you know, videos on the subject. And I want to change that. This video will be going over these claims, as well as ones of a similar nature in several different games, to see if they have any merit whatsoever. This first game we're looking at is a very popular example, and it's one of the biggest reasons I made this video in the first place. It involves a little game, which some of you may know, called Worlds.com. An honest to goodness three dimensional walk around world. Worlds.com, which we'll just call Worlds from here on, is a virtual chat room type game from way back in the mid 90s. The game itself lets players create their own custom avatars and worlds, and you can even have players visit them, or alternatively, just use the more general rooms created by the devs to talk in. There's not much more to the gameplay than that. There's not really any mini games or actual interactive stuff to do. It's just a bunch of chat rooms you can talk and emote in. Back in its heyday, though, there were various events and crossovers with a bunch of different bands and movies, but that's long since stopped. For reference, though, there's full worlds dedicated to David Bowie, Aerosmith, and the Blair Witch Project. The basic gameplay is classic FPS tank controls, along with a chat box where you can do crazy stuff like chat. Now, under the surface, there is some strange stuff going on with this one. And that's before we get into any cult shenanigans. It's a pretty decently well-known thing that the owner of Worlds is a patent troll, which is pretty much the only thing keeping the game running. Just a quick search of Worlds Inc. patent, and you'll get results showing that they've been in court with Bungie, Blizzard, and as recently as 2020, they were suing f***ing Microsoft over Minecraft. Now, if you don't know what any of this means, they've held patents since 2001 for very basic and general concepts in gaming, such as interacting with others in a 3D online space, which obviously applies to, like, literally every multiplayer game ever made. Now, because they hold these patents, uh, Worlds has the legal right to ask for royalties for using their ideas. And from what I've seen, they still hold these patents to this day. The launcher itself for the game even displays the patent numbers, which I've never seen in any other game. From what I've researched, though, the owner of Worlds still has to prove that the patents are being put to use, so the game has to continue running and it needs to have active players in order for them to keep these patents, which is why it's still up today. Anyways, with that rundown of the game and how it's even still running out of the way, let's dive right into the deeper, darker, spookier, cult stuff. Since the early 2010s, and maybe even a bit before, there have been rumors running wild about an old abandoned chat room game called Worlds. Forum posts detailing strange users, abandoned worlds, and other odd occurrences in game. People in these threads would often document their findings, usually being worlds that were untouched for a decade or more. Every now and then there would even be an article or two detailing how weird the game was, usually saying something along the lines of, check out this creepy 90s chat room game before it's lost forever. With this newfound attention, many rumors began to spread about the game. The bulk of these rumors centered around one player in particular, a user named Nexialist. There were posts and videos made about him in various places, from the bigger sites like Reddit and 4chan, to smaller, now defunct forums. These usually recounted how he would get people to follow him around and would then show them strange, satanic imagery. Other posts talked about how he would send them audio files that sounded like distorted, screeching animals. This post here from over 10 years ago has numerous links to different files they were sent, which are sadly all broken at this point. Another common story when encountering Nexialist would be that he would simply stalk you, teleporting around you and observing you wherever you went. There was nowhere you could hide. And of course, all these posts almost always mentioned his creepy outfit and overall demeanor. The people going onto sites like 4chan posting about him only led to more people hopping on to try to find him themselves, which meant that he had a constant stream of people to mess with. These world threads were common enough that there was even speculation on sites like 4chan that these posts were Nexialist trying to lure people into playing the game. Some even speculated that Nexialist was the owner of Worlds himself, trying to keep the game alive with a weird marketing stunt like this, but I don't think there's any real evidence proving that. What can be said for certain, though, is that Nexialist was a weird dude. Aside from Nexialist, there were other strange cultish things on Worlds as well. The other main thing of note is a mugshot room by a user named Jimbly. The world is full of stolen pictures of various people and nothing much else, leading to plenty of speculation regarding its purpose. There's been talks of blackmail, stalking, 
and unsolicited naughty images being posted. And it's at this point that I genuinely can't, with a straight face, keep up the storytelling here about how any of this nefarious cult stuff is real in any way. And we're just gonna tear it all down real quick. Starting with the mugshot room, since that's probably obvious to most people, but that's genuinely just a world where users could send in pictures of themselves for others to see. You've gotta keep in mind that this was in an era before modern social media, so emailing the owner Jimbly a picture of yourself was the only way a lot of these people could ever see one another. It's an innocent world that has been speculated to be something real greasy. It's not even unique either. While most of the worlds are gone nowadays, back in its heyday, worlds had plenty of servers just like this. It's genuinely not even unique to worlds, as I've seen this in other virtual hangout games just like it. But what about Nexialist? The spooky dookie chat room cult leader. He's just some guy. Yep. Uh, yeah. That's it. You see... It was all an elaborate troll, a ruse, a goof, and you all fell for it. All it took was years of regularly messing with people and being absolutely committed to the bit. There's genuinely dozens of posts on various forums from people who know him and say that it's all just a troll and that he's actually a pretty chill guy when out of character. A lot of them are prominent members of the world's community as well, so it's not just random people. Also, I would have liked to show off some of those old forums and 4chan threads which were speculated to have been posted in by Nexialist himself, but they are long gone at this point, so you're gonna have to take the word of some repost blogs that they existed. The site Whirlio is frequently linked when discussing Nexialist nowadays, and it combs over and disproves pretty much all rumors surrounding the game, cult or not. I will say though that the effort he put into things like audio files and weird satanic worlds, combined with the speculation about who he is and what his deal is, all combined to make a pretty compelling case from the outside looking in. But with the amount of people I've seen say that he's just a regular guy, and even that he's grown out of the trolling nowadays, this one is simply done for. On top of all of this, while Worlds is seemingly abandonware, the game itself is actually actively played by a decent number of regulars, and even has moderation to this day. So if there was an actual cult being this blatant, uh, they'd simply be banned. Worlds even keeps chat logs of all the chats too, it's not like encrypted or anything. So anything illegal or bad in the chat has a permanent log that the admins can check, whether it's cult related or not. I tried logging in over a number of days at different hours, just to see if I could spot him. You know, maybe I could, maybe I'd have a chat with him, but uh, I never found him, so I'm not sure if he's still active. It's entirely possible I could have just missed him though. Well, this whole thing is a fun concept, you know, a strange, creepy cult operating within a long forgotten 90s game. Uh, sadly, this one just isn't real. <laughs> After all this research into Nexialist, I was heavily reminded of a similar thing that happened in 2016 to the stream of Vine Sauce, while he was exploring a similar game called Active Worlds. Due to being a similarly old and clunky game, his audience unknowingly crashed the signups for it with the amount of traffic going to the site, meaning that the game was only populated by those that already had accounts. So. Uh, basically nobody. After exploring for a bit, he came across what seemed to be an NPC named Hitomi Fujiko, who was saying things like, Are you lost? But it was quickly shown that this was indeed a real person, albeit one acting very strangely. They were speaking in weird ways, asking if they themselves were real, and a whole bunch of other strange stuff. Things ended with Hitomi wishing him farewell by name and fading away. Following this was a ton of speculation on who this was, with a lot of people being really creeped out or at the least curious about the situation. But, just like Nexialist, uh, this was revealed to just be someone playing a character and being damn good at it. Posts were made by Hitomi shortly after this, saying that they already had an account and were familiar with the game, so they were the only person able to log in at the time. Overall, what I'm getting at here is that instances of these strange, ominous, creepy peepee -pee players in games like this are just people playing characters, and rarely, if ever, an actually scary person. With that said, I hope people keep doing this kind of stuff because it's really cool and also pretty much entirely harmless. Like, who cares? Wrapping back to and wrapping up worlds, while the game is definitely strange, pretty much none of the rumors surrounding things going on in-game have any legitimacy. This is the game with the f***ing googie room in it. Do you really think a cult is in this game? With all of that said, this one was just the beginning of my research, and if all of that was fake, I was already starting to wonder if any of these would be real. For this one, we're going to talk about something a little bit different here, as this one is a single-player RPG Maker game. I wanted some like this as well, seeing as there's about as many rumors of cult-made games as there are cults in online games. So you get these too. Think of it as a bonus. The game itself we're looking at here is Kanye Quest 3030. It's a really short little 
two hour-ish long game from 2013. And for the purposes of this video, uh, the game itself really doesn't actually matter all that much. I'll still give a brief rundown here for anyone unfamiliar. The game has Kanye West fall through a portal in the year 2010 while taking out the trash, ending up with him in a dystopian year 3030 America. From there, you team up with and face off against various famous rappers, musicians, and hip-hop artists from over the years. Again, the actual game part isn't really the main focus of this one. You see, the game held a dark secret within. A mysterious cult, buried in game beneath hidden codes, puzzles, and passwords that took years to emerge. But for that story, we'll have to rewind. In the way back year of 2015, an anonymous pastebin post was posted, definitely totally not by the creator of the game, which detailed their eerie spooky replay of the RPG, where they discovered a dark secret. The post opens up with the author saying that they haven't played Kanye Quest in over two years, and when they did, it wasn't for more than five minutes. They go on to say that they decided to give it an honest try this time around, and would beat the game this time. Early on in the game, they noticed a little bit of fluff text, which most players had likely seen, which, when filling in the blanks, reads, Ascend and worship the based god, but they really thought nothing of it. After a bit more of normal play, further into the game there's an NPC who asks you what you want to do. Now, normally here, any answer you give is met with the exact same response, but the author tried to type ascend just to see what happens, and something scary and demented ended up happening instead of the normal response, but then being transported to a brand new area. This new location immediately tells them to keep it a secret and that the entire game is a front for what they're about to see. What they were experiencing now was the real Kanye quest. It then gave a message reading, quote, Congratulations, you have proven yourself to be an open-minded and curious thinker. We must apologize for deceiving you, but we can reveal that the game you were playing until this point was a front, constructed to protect what you are currently accessing. We must ask that you do not reveal this area to the public. If you believe that you may be prone to revealing information or do not wish to participate, please close this program immediately by pressing Alt F4 or selecting the no option when it appears. By selecting the yes option, you agree to participate and not reveal information. And then if you select yes, the dialogue continues. The following is a thought experiment designed to help teach you something beneficial. By undertaking this exercise, you will hopefully be affected in a positive way. Due to the nature of the exercise, this something cannot be revealed immediately. This exercise may or may not be restricted to this software. It is important to remember that the purpose of the exercise is to benefit you. You will not be timed. We cannot provide any more information, except that we wish you good luck. You may begin now. Welcome to your ascension. And then for the next little bit, they are faced with a puzzle and do some typical ARG cracking stuff and then get another yes no prompt upon completion. This one congratulates them for their ascension, but also says that further ascension is still possible. If they select yes, they would like to ascend further, they get this message. Over the following two week time period, we will interact with you and your possessions in several ways. Keep an eye out, as some of these may be subtle, others may not be. We may attempt to contact you directly. If we do this, we will attempt to notify you of our presence using a keyword. If you still consent to participation, please select the yes option. Do you wish to participate? If you select yes again, the player is met with the following screen, where the game asks for all kinds of info. Your address, name, postal code, basically everything you need to find somebody. The author still entered all the relevant info and submitted it with the game saying to enjoy the next two weeks and to await instruction. After this part, the paceman goes on about a bunch of potential leads and ARG stuff that we'll talk about later. And by the way, all of this is completely replicable by anyone playing the game themselves today. You could download the game right now and do all of this. We are now going to pivot to talk a bit more about the in-game cult, Ascensionism. Most of this info is from the pastebin itself, and since that's very likely made by the author, it's worth discussing. Ascensionism is a New Age religion that dates back to at least 2006 based on the first Wikipedia edits. The pastebin states that it revolves around the body having a physical spirit, the body, and an ethereal spirit, the soul. While the body dies, the soul continues to live on through many lifetimes and is then judged by itself. If they're good enough, they nuke themselves and become super duper souls that new souls then form from. The pastebin states that orthodox ascensionism believes souls form packs with other souls they'll encounter in that lifetime, meaning that any harm done to a person was agreed upon by their soul and the other persons. This justifies any harm they perpetrate against people. It then talks about how if a person is cloned, their soul can't die until the clones are all dead. 
And if it can't die, the soul will get more wicked and evil because it gets corrupted by bad circumstances. And it can't be purged by death to start anew. Uh, uh, confusing. I know. I don't really understand it either. This relates it to the game, where the evil characters are clones of rappers that have accumulated evil over a long period of time, while the good characters are clones that have been dormant for so long that they couldn't accumulate the bad energies through experience. And with that, all the pieces are falling into place, as this marks a direct connection between the game and Ascensionism. Uh, so anyways, none of this is real, obviously, uh, and the whole thing is an art project by a musician named Clara Hope. Not only is this an art project, uh, it's a high school project. This wasn't actually known for many years and was a pretty big internet mystery for a good while, with plenty of massive channels trying to find the mysterious creator behind Kanye Quest. Some people even thought that there was a chance that this was a real thing, since there was no creator to ask about it. This changed in 2022 when the channel Gross House, which I think is how you say that, dropped a six-part globe-trotting adventure documentary called Finding Jesus, in which they pursue pretty much every lead that the game has ever had, and eventually do uncover the creator, the previously mentioned Clara Hope, and the interviewer. I'd highly recommend checking this series out if you want more info on Kanye Quest's origins, as it has a criminally low view count, especially compared to videos talking about Kanye Quest as this, like, totally real, uh, crazy brainwashing game. Like, you gotta check these out after this video is done. One of the points I found pretty interesting from the interview was that Clara completely made up the game's rendition of Asaginism. It doesn't mean anything or refer to any real-world cult. And she purely chose it because she noticed a bunch of New Age spiritual and cult stuff all going by the name Ascensionism, and to be as confusing as possible, named her ARG that as well. She then says that it seemed like that paid off as it caused a ton of chaos and confusion. That's all I want to mention from it here though, as at the very least, their last episode is worth a view for the interview. And I don't want to just steal it and regurgitate everything here, as they clearly put a ton of work in for the series. Check it out after this. One nail in the coffin for this being completely fake before any of this was revealed, though, is that you don't even have to be connected to the internet for that info form to say it was sent. You know, the one with the, the address and the name and stuff. You don't need to be connected to anything. Not only that, but opening up the game inside RPG Maker reveals that the screen which says it's sending the info is literally just a three second timer that says complete at the end. It doesn't save anything or send it anywhere. It's all baloney. One guy on reddit.com in 2019 even noticed that the paste bin that totally wasn't posted by the creator of the game purposefully edited out that the game doesn't send anything anywhere and left a very thought out response on why the whole thing is fake, which was met with an equally thought out response. Shut up. For this one, we're going to pivot to a game that was actually made by a cult developer, with this one being the incredibly infamous and dangerous Om Shinrikyo Cult, which in English roughly translates to Supreme Truth. We'll start by looking at the cult itself, and if you've never heard of them before, then trust me when I say this, these were not good people. Like, everything you hear about them somehow continually gets worse. So let's start with some background. Founded in 1987 in Tokyo by a man named Shoko Asahara, this bearded fella here, this cult was originally just a uh, yoga and meditation kind of thing. Real small time and would have likely been forgotten by history within a few years. However, it quickly branched into religion, combining aspects of a bunch of different ones with Asahara declaring himself as Christ. This quickly gained traction and with some pretty powerful and rich people, too. I've read that this was known as the religion for the elite. After only two years of operation, they had officially been classed as a religious organization by the Japanese government. They'd amassed thousands of followers. They were even writing books and doing public speaking at prestigious universities. Really, in short here, they had made it big in a very small amount of time. In just a few short years, OM was a countrywide organization with multiple compounds, millions of dollars, and thousands of extremely devoted followers. You can probably see how this very quickly became a very dangerous group. About as quickly as they rose, they began to fall. As in the coming years, mostly during the early 90s, Ohm did a ton, and I mean a ton, of awful, heinous, irredeemable, no good, very, very bad actions. To give you an idea of how bad things were here, like two thirds of Ohm's Wikipedia article is just crimes they committed. All of this culminated with police finally catching on in the mid-90s after years of them getting away with it. The police finally putting things together planned a mass raid on Ohm facilities across the country. Unfortunately, Shoko Asahara was tipped off regarding this and decided that they would need 
a little distraction. This little distraction he had planned was to let loose a bunch of incredibly dangerous chemicals in the Tokyo subway, which resulted in over a dozen deaths and injured over a thousand others. This little distraction didn't even do anything for them, as Ohm was still raided and over a hundred members were arrested, including Asahara. Despite all of this, from what I can tell, Ohm's rebrand and multiple splinter groups still exist to this day. So after all of that, a recruitment game for the cult was released called The Story of Kamakuishiki Village, which has you playing as Shoko Asahara himself. You've got to manage the day-to-day -day of the cult, raising funds, managing and recruiting members, and generally keep the whole thing running. You can make some serious coin in this game by selling your cult leader bathwater or your blood for people to drink. As for the artwork, everything is really crudely drawn as you can probably see, and it looks like it's right out of a pilot Red Sun animation. The stuff that isn't hand drawn is mostly actual highly compressed live action news footage, as well as actual propaganda videos made by the cult. As well as this, there's also multiple black and white photos of real world cult members used in the game. All this footage and stuff ballooned the game's file size as it needs like 12 floppy disks to install. Progression in the game is time based, and things move forward with every action you take. There's multiple events that happen no matter what on certain dates, which happen in real life on said dates, such as murders and other things of a similarly violent nature. After enough time passes, the game has two endings. In the first one, the, uh, the good ending, the 1995 subway incident occurs, and in the other, Doomsday occurs. Uh, I, I forgot to mention, uh, they were, they were also a Doomsday cult that predicted nuclear war. Now obviously, just from the looks of things here, this game is absolutely terrible. Really, it's only noteworthy because of the obvious cult association. And here is where I stop lying to you. Rug pull, big reveal. Uh, this game is actually entirely satirical. Yeah, uh, for years this has been reported on as a real recruitment propaganda tool made by the cult, which is somewhat fair as there's a language barrier, obviously for English players, as well as a cultural barrier. It's obvious how there was a mix-up, as purely looking at the visuals, it does look like some weird creepy cult game, especially with all the actual cult imagery used, but it's simply not. This game is like if they made Heaven's Gate Space Program and people passed it off as real. The big turning point in discussion around this game was seemingly around when Vice dropped an article in which they translated it and pretty much debunked the entire thing. Despite the amount of time that passed, they even got in touch with a friend of the developers for a little interview. And this friend happened to be the developer of the similarly infamous Hong Kong 97, but that's unrelated. Now despite this article, there is still somehow people passing it off as like a real crazy cult game somehow. I, I don't know how. It's everywhere now that this is fake. The game itself was made by two high schoolers. That's two in a row now. And basically it's a mid 90s elaborate shit post, which is purely mocking the cult and in absolutely no way glorifying it or trying to make it look good. It was sold primarily in underground magazines and basically says the same thing I just did, that it's not associated with the cult and that they hate them. If you wanted a copy, this would have run you 14,500 yen, which today is around the 100 big ones when converted to American and adjusted for inflation. That's all I really have to say on this one though. If you want more specific info on stuff, I would recommend just giving the Vice article a read. It's pretty interesting. The game itself is on archive.org, but good luck playing it if you don't speak Japanese. Now you might have noticed, uh, way back at the beginning of the segment, I played a couple anime clips that were centered around them, and you're probably thinking, you know, those are also fake or satire. Uh, no. Actually, nope, uh, uh, yeah, that's real. Now, despite all of the revelations coming out years ago, I thought at the very least this one was legit. And it wasn't until researching for this video that I found out any of this was satirical. And I'm sure that same thing goes for many others as well. But with three of three of the ones I knew of turning out to be fake or satire, I decided I was going to dig deeper to see if I could find some real ones. And let me tell you now, they absolutely exist. For these next two, we are going to look at two definitive, actual, non-speculative, 100% cult-associated developers and the games that they've made. Uh, there's no more rug pulls or lying, I promise. The one we're looking at now is the first actual example of a cult-developed game in the video. For the next little bit, we are going to be discussing the game studio Divine Gaming Incorporated. It's a relatively new studio that formed around 2020, which hasn't yet developed any games, but rather a very large, game-sized Minecraft overhaul mod. Let's get into it. The founder of the studio, Jeff Divine, is also the co-founder of Twin Flames Universe, an active cult. Before we dive into the studio, let's go over said cult. 
Right off the bat, I want to say that I'm not an expert on this one. I heard about it during the research for this, so I'm not particularly well versed in their antics. So don't take everything I say here as 100% fact. One of the first things to mention that's a pretty good indicator of how bad things are with this one though, is that there is not one, but two different documentaries on them. One on Amazon Prime and one on Netflix. These are named Desperately Seeking Soulmate, Escaping Twin Flames Universe, and Escaping Twin Flames, respectively. The cult itself is all about finding your twin flame, so basically your soulmate, with the cult serving as guidance, mostly through selling extremely expensive courses on how to do so. The owners are Jeff and Shayla Devine, who have both proclaimed themselves to be Christ. The two will assign members a twin flame who the member is encouraged to pursue, heavily. Right around here is where I'd go over the day-to-day -day of the cult, but you gotta remember, uh, we're in modern times now. It's just all online. Their day-to-day -day is just making YouTube videos and selling courses. Into the thick of it, here's some of the allegations against them. Most of these are from the two documentaries, and some are from articles written about them. Allegedly, they forced or heavily encouraged members to undergo gender transitions, be it through full surgery or socially transitioning. Members have to switch to their assigned, not chosen, divine gender, being either divine masculine or divine feminine. The group believes that you can only pair a divine feminine and a divine masculine, and since the majority of members are women, their balance was off and they resorted to simply assigning more divine masculines. Multiple people went as far as getting top surgery under their guidance. Allegedly, they encourage stalking exes and harassment in general. If someone was said to be your twin flame and they rejected you, you simply weren't trying hard enough. Frequently, this included violating restraining orders. Allegedly, they charge ludicrous amounts of money for their sessions. Hundreds to many thousands of dollars. Their everything package costs $8,888. Allegedly. And then there's also more general cult stuff, like isolation, controlled lifestyles regarding relationships, diet and exercise, being untrusting of outsiders, spiritual healing sessions, complete devotion and worship of the leaders, and other things of the sort that are typically seen in cults. And many other things are in those documentaries that would take much longer to explain. A lot of individual stories that are just really sad and frequently involve cutting off family and friends. We can stop there though and just say that it's pretty clear overall. They are greasy. Allegedly. Even Wikipedia isn't afraid to call them a cult. A similar thing I saw not associated with TFU to my knowledge was that this kind of twin flame soulmate stalking stuff happened to literally me in 2014, resulting in a restraining order when the individual in question flew across the country and showed up to literally my house in Hollywood. We'll start things off by taking a really quick peek at their website before we get into the mod itself. Their homepage is just a full page ad for the mod, but from here we can go to their team page where it is confirmed beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is founded by the same Jeff Devine as Twin Flames Universe. Also from this, I learned that their CEO is also one of TFU's certified ascension coaches. Uh, whatever that means. So, this whole thing runs deep. Now originally, this video was supposed to simply be a compilation of a bunch of cults and games to see if they were legit. But since this one, as of now, has had such little coverage online, I figure I'll do a little field research. Let's see what we can dig up. Starting out on the actual mod page, this is apparently a $500,000 project. Initially, I was confused by this because uh, they don't elaborate on it here at all, but checking their Patreon, I learned that the initial investment was $250,000 and they have an upkeep of $20,000 a month. They have four paying patrons, by the way, so... The return on investment here is not looking good. The other noteworthy thing with this mod is that it's not complete, but rather has its first chapter out. There was an update as recently as January 2024 saying that they're still working on the mod though, so it's not dead. Yet. I'm fairly certain that this one does have multiplayer, meaning it's online, but I'm not paying any money to their Patreon in order to get access to their weird cult Discord in order to join it. Without further ado, let's get into things proper. You start off the mod in an apartment overlooking this giant city. We're in adventure mode or something, so I, I can't really interact with anything in here. The only real thing to do in the area is to talk to this NPC to start the mod. Now, from this guy, I noticed uh, they added feet to NPCs. Uh, it's gotta be where at least a fifth of that half a million dollar budget went. All this guy does is start the mod. From here, I had to select the difficulty. Hard mode is listed as being for gamers, so the choice was obvious. Actually getting into it, the atmosphere did a complete 180. It was raining. I was on a creaky dock. It was the middle of the night and a voice narrator was telling me to run for my life. You need to run. Ooh. 
I hate to say it, but like visually this mod is actually pretty good. The run from the werewolves is intense. You traverse a path that has a giant enemy spider cameo, a hedge maze, and ends with you taking shelter in an abandoned building. After the werewolves lost my scent and left, a unicorn hustled over and picked me up, took me for a ride, and dropped me off at a gamer manor. It's a pretty intense start for a mod, and I died a few times right off the bat. Oh shit. Oh shit, I'm stuck. That was bullshit. You need to run. You need to run. You need, you need to, to run. run. <laughs> you need to run. You need to run. For some reason though, uh, after this fast-paced action start, the mod grinds to an absolute halt and forces you to essentially do a 20 minute tutorial on how to play fucking minecraft like it has you going outside to pick up sticks and stuff it, it absolutely just destroys the pacing the final objective here with this little tutorial bit is for you to make a full set of iron armor an iron sword and a shield and upon doing so you're told to take back the house. I thought this would just be a simple little walk through the place, you know, killing a zombie every now and then, but they put an absolutely absurd amount of zombies into this place. I had to clear out dozens at a time. I even needed to replace my sword halfway through. It took like 20 minutes to clear the place out, and all that was left was the boss in the attic. When I got up there, it was a giant, like, bloodborne chalice dungeon looking boss named Garbage. Uh, he kind of sucked though, and was pretty easy. After taking the place back, I was told by the narrator that I had to get my estate in order and then head into town. This is the last time he speaks, by the way. They, uh, they completely forget about him. Now for another 180 in tone, getting my estate in order meant becoming like a Michelin star chef, as the mod wanted me to start farming for all kinds of ingredients to make a divine dish to sell in the town. Luckily, the game gives you plenty while taking back the house, which I just stockpiled, so I already had enough. So I was off to the big city. Wait, what? Dude, dude. <laughs> Along the way, there were a ton of weird mushrooms growing all over the place. Eating each kind gave a different weird effect and I couldn't stop trying them even though all of them were just annoying or bad. I did get real freaked out when one of them opened a tab in my browser and started playing a video embedded on their site. Sassy e-girl. What the f is this? It's opening shit on my other fucking computer. Dude, what the f As you can see, it was just that old classic skit of the girl crying over loving cats, but still, it really weirded me out in the moment, as you could probably see. It wasn't, like, scary weird, just unexpected. Another one I tried was called the Beeswax Room, which just instantly killed me because they're really funny and, uh, like, great jokesters. After I couldn't find my stuff, I whopped out the cheat codes and just started testing all the mushrooms. There's a few other Link ones that play videos on their site, but they're all just popular old videos like Nyan Cat, Rick Roll, and other stuff like that. I'm honestly amazed they had the restraint to not link one of their own videos. Anyways, since the voice in my head told me to go sell divine dishes in town, that's what I was gonna do. I got to the gates and gave the guard a divine dish, and he, ch he just moaned in ecstasy and let me in. The town was pretty gargantuan from what I could tell, and one of the first places I stopped into was this place called Kennedy's Baked Goods. Inside was Chef Kennedy, who was a vocal mix of Super Mario and Roman Bellic from GTA 4. Hello, stranger! How did you make it past the guards? They've been on the edge since the reckoning. He too moaned in pleasure upon trying my divine dish. May I have one? This mod is weird. Giving him a taste of my meat led him to calling me the chosen one, or, or something like that. Uh, he kind of just started rambling on about how I was blessed by God and angels and had to go kill someone. Which, you know, that would reward me with all kinds of jewels, emeralds, diamonds, gold, crystals, sapphires, rubies, gems, goblets, treasures, riches, and the chance to meet the king. He gave me a list of shit to get before I started off, which included needing two glocks, a double barrel shotgun, and thousands of rounds of ammunition. Two f***ing Glocks? <laughs> what? What is happening? 
I arm myself with a Kimbo Divine Gaming Inc. branded Glocks, a double barrel shotgun, and everything else on Kennedy's list. I was ready for some action. Uh, also, I cheated literally all of these items because it looked like an absolutely tedious and mind-numbing grind to get them legitimately. Before I left, I had a look at the other shops on the street first. It's all normal stuff like an armory, gun store, a cat cafe with an actual cat girl waitress, and a church called the Church of the Union at the end of the street. Now at first I thought nothing of it, but then the cogs in my brain started turning, and I decided to simply give the church a quick little search on Google. Hold on. There it is. The more I played this one, the further this rabbit hole went. At first, I thought this was just a placement for their church, but looking at the executive members, we have the CEO of Divine Gaming Inc., as well as a fellow named Jason Emmerich. At first, I thought nothing of him, but later when I did some more research, simply looking up Divine Dish to see if there was anything, a little website came up that at first I thought was unrelated. But upon further inspection, you know, crossing some connections here, really putting together my big conspiracy board, uh, there he is. Jason Emmerich. With this find, I'm gonna say there is zero chance that there's not a ton of subtle cult connections in the mod like this that I simply didn't catch on to. Based on all of this, I wouldn't be surprised if I found out they were actually manufacturing Divine Gaming Inc. branded Glocks. Now before this, I was ready to call it a day on this one. Ready to say, you know, it's a decent but weird little Minecraft mod, you know, whatever. I, I couldn't find any cult connections. And then I found this, you know. Now I've got to keep going. Again, I likely missed some direct references to their cult since I'm relatively unfamiliar with their ins and outs, so if you're more knowledgeable and you spot anything in this, let me know. Regardless, I was going to see things through to the end at this point. I had to get a map from Kevin the Cartographer, who was by far the best voice actor in the mod. So, you want to get to the zombie lord? To the north of the castle, there's an old goat path. He gave me the map to the old goat path, which is the trail that I need to follow, so I was off. Now initially I was following along the path, doing jump puzzles and taking it seriously, and then I thought to myself, why? So I hopped in creative and just flew along. I gotta say, this was absolutely the right decision as this path just keeps going. It would genuinely take like an hour to follow it normally, and it's just fighting waves of basic mobs and nothing more. This mod really, really likes to waste your time to pad its length. to the mod, or at least the artists, uh, design-wise, everything in this mod looks very nice. I can't fault the artists behind it at all. The world is pretty much entirely custom-built and very, very expansive. It's not just settlements either, but it seems like they also handcrafted the environments, foliage, and pretty much everything else. Anyways, I eventually did reach the end of the goat path and came across the old goat lady. At first, I was 99% sure her voice was just AI because it sounds so, so, so bad. But then I really listened in and I'm fairly certain that this voice was done by co-founder of TFU, Shalea Devine, Jeff Devine's twin flame wife. I'm not taking the risk at all of playing one of their videos to compare them directly here, but if you pull up a video and listen to her, you will definitely hear the similarities. He is held prisoner in the crater. I have been keeping him at bay for many years now. My goats keep me good company. I have no way of actually proving this though, as they didn't credit their voice actors. This is where the mod really starts getting into biblical stuff. She frequently brings up the power of God and love being in my heart, and things like angels protecting me and letting my heart guide me. She also revealed that she was the thought-to-be-deceased queen who disappeared long ago. Now, normally, obviously, 
There's nothing inherently wrong with stuff like this being in stories, but the specific wording she used, some of it is really eerily similar to some of the stuff said on this page in specific, compared to what the old goat lady says. I'm not gonna get too into it, but it's, it's strange. So this is the Zombie King. That's close enough, hero. They sent you to kill me, didn't they? He's, uh, he's pretty generic, basically just being a uh, join me and we'll rule shit together. Uh, I'm friends with the devil, you boy Satan type villain. Uh, but somehow he drags that on for like a full seven minute unskippable monologue. So hero. What's your favorite FNAF game? I took out his goons, and his stank breath was all up in my face, so I cut him down. And now, I was headed back to Kennedy the Chef. Upon my return, my boy Kennedy was absolutely ecstatic to see me. He said that I need to do another quest before I could get my jewels and meet the king. So, basically, all of that was for nothing. I had to meet up with some highfalutin, high society folk to get this new quest, so say goodnight to the chef. Uh, you're not gonna see him again. He doesn't show up again, that's it. The rich folk were more of the same, uh, more of the whole, like, blessed by angels, God in your heart kind of stuff. Very quickly as a uh, little note here, these two are 100% not a single doubt in my mind, voiced by the CEO and her twin flame husband. Again, I'm not playing any clips of them, but you'll hear it instantly if you play them back to back. I think it's maybe not so great anymore. Or maybe... He was never great, but I digress. He is the skeleton king, living in the northeastern snowy mountains. Uh, they were very kindly asking me to do a quest for them, but the dude had a loaded gun out the whole time, which sent a bit of a fierce signal to me. Uh, anyways, this was another seven minute unskippable dialogue that pretty much just amounted to go kill the boss. So I was off again. And again, another stupidly long trek to actually get to the place. This time was by boat. I got lost multiple times during this and only made it by sheer luck. I was met with this Eye of Sauron type mob that shot beams at me that I had to deflect. Now this would be a pretty cool encounter if they didn't reuse it like nine times after this. A bit further in, I encountered a character named the Angel Vendor. I thought this would be some more direct cult stuff, but he basically said, Hey bro, you're gonna need this. And then he gave me an Uzi. Uh, this was honestly an understatement. The whole dungeon leading up to this boss was so absurdly long. It was actually excruciating. And I was playing with cheats on. There were so many enemies, literally hundreds, coming at me in waves of like 50, including boss enemies. Uh, also, Jig is up. Uh, this is on the easy difficulty, by the way. Anyways, a bit further in, the angel vendor straight up says that he's an angel of God and that I was sent by old Gotti boy to do this shit. It's not worth going over everything in the dungeon, but I'll say that it legit had multiple different types of builds. At one point, we were outside in the snow, then underground in a cave, and then a dungeon, then hell, then a dungeon again, and then a cave again. You, you get the idea. All of this was handcrafted, too. Not just regular Minecraft biomes. And even had scripting, custom scripting for events like a cave-in at some points. The overall time it took to get to the boss was just over two hours, and I was playing with cheats the whole time. The Zombie King's trail and lead-up was peanuts compared to this. Anyways, this segment has been going on for a while, so let's use this little hell cart ride as a little intermission. I want to start by saying that I'm sorry this one's such a long segment, but I wanted to give this one proper coverage since not a lot of people have. I'm hoping someone more knowledgeable on TFU sees this and can go over some of the more specific cult references in the mod. If you do see any, let me know in the comments or elsewhere. I'm interested in knowing. As for the art and programming, uh, I'm not gonna lie. Overall, it does seem to be very good for the most part. It just sucks that it's tied to Twin Flames universe. I don't doubt that figure of $500,000 being spent on the mod though, as they apparently employ a full team to work on it, and it shows. One does wonder what they hope to get out of this though, as single player Minecraft mods, they're not exactly money makers. Anyways. Let's just enjoy the views for a bit before we finish this one off.
Next up on the chopping block was the skeleton king. Luckily, this guy's dialogue was a lot more to the point. Alright, he just talks about being buds with the devil, and then I kill him. Easy peasy. Teleporting back to the high society city slickers, uh, they basically told me, Haha, just kidding. You can't see the king yet. You still have five more bosses to kill. Fuck you. And that's it. That's the mod ends. It's, it's done. Uh, overall, this is a very strange mod. It starts as a horror mod with werewolves that have zero plot relevance afterwards. Moves to survival mode for like 20 minutes. And then basically becomes dynasty warriors with how many mobs you have to kill. All the while, I can't decide if it's a comedy, biblical, or horror focused. And it's just an absolute mess in both pacing and tone. And don't forget that the company that made this is genuinely owned by a cult. <laughs> like, it actually is. I can almost... Guarantee. 100%. I pu I'd put money on this. When you meet the king, he will be voiced by Jeff Devine himself. That's it for this one, though, at least for now. You know, if, if chapter 2 releases, I might look into it, and if it gets more overtly culty, I might make it a full video. Let's move on from this one. Please, finally. This next one we're looking at is another one that has direct cult involvement. And to my knowledge, it is historically the first cult made game. For this one, we're going back to the 1980s. The Silver Sisterhood, which also went by a couple other names, was a small town Irish cult of only women, which was pretty much the polar opposite of organizations like OM. They weren't particularly too interesting. They weren't dangerous, and were pretty much just a group of women living like it was the Victorian era. They grew their own food and practiced self-sufficiency, held their own spiritual beliefs, didn't use electricity or modern appliances, weren't very controversial, and probably would be completely forgotten if not for the games they ended up making. Like, just watch this clip here, where they talk about one of their grand plans. We're going to be opening a craft shop and tea rooms. We felt that there was very little opportunity in the village for people to have a civilized cup of tea, as it were. Um, From what I can tell, they also change things up every now and then. I know that at one point they were trying to recreate the experience of a 1920s girls boarding school, with all the members acting as if it really were one, with them even allowing guests to stay and experience it. Also, from what I can tell, they never broke character, and really did just live like it was the time period they chose. Since they were so small and relatively obscure, there's really not a ton of info about them, and really it's not worth a super deep dive or really even possible to do one. Now you may be wondering how it's possible that these women were responsible for anything video game related since they didn't use electricity. Well, they still had to pay the bills. While they didn't allow entertainment like TV, making games was seen as a positive since it was a creative endeavor that could make them some cash too. So that's how their game production began. Their first published game was a 1985 text adventure called The Secret of St. Brides. The game itself has you staying at their place as a guest and you have to uncover their devious secret. It's an underground 80s text adventure so there's not a ton of info on the game, but from what I can tell based on this answers guide, uh, you get into shootouts, you get jewels, gold, amulets, emeralds, diamonds, crystals, sapphires, rubies, gems, whatever the secret is it sounds like it's pretty crazy. I don't know the reception to this one or if it was even widely released as it's fairly obscure. The only game that has any real historical significance to the games industry is their game from 1987 called Jack the Ripper. It's another text adventure along with the rest of their games with this one being noteworthy for being the first game to receive the British 18 certificate due to its descriptions of violence. Obviously the game is incredibly tame by modern standards I mean, like, it's it's literally a text adventure. But back in the 80s, I guess it was worthy of that. Getting the writing was no accident, though, as they did it on purpose as a bit of PR trolling, all in order to get the word out about the game. The game itself doesn't actually have you trying to find or play as Jack the Ripper, or anything like that, but rather has you accused of being him, and you've got to clear your name. With that said, trying to summarize these is like trying to summarize a choose-your-own-adventure book, and I'm fairly sure they aren't propaganda pieces or anything like that, just normal games. So I'll leave it there. Pretty much all their games are up on archive.org, including Jack the Ripper, if anyone wants to try them out. I doubt the audience for these games is very big nowadays, though, but, you know, they're a neat piece of history. And that's about it for this one. Pretty mild overall, but, you know, it's the first ever cult-developed game, which I thought was interesting. Wowie Zowie. As a very quick side note for this one though, and this is weird, in the research for this one in a few YouTube comment sections and elsewhere, I saw people speculating and saying that one of the members from this one became, like, a VTuber? or something like that. I didn't dive into it because there wasn't any definitive evidence to my knowledge, and I also learned that they've since passed away, but it was a weird rabbit hole. It's a huge stretch and really specific, but 
if somehow someone has anything more definitive on that, let me know. VRChat is an online interactive virtual reality chatting program used primarily for chatting. Unbelievable, I know. It's really open in terms of what there is to actually do, a lot like Gmod, with players being able to add avatars, make custom worlds, game modes, and a lot more. It's really just a big VR sandbox. And this community-made nature of the game means that all kinds of groups play it for all kinds of reasons. Average Joes, kids, the elderly, anime enthusiasts, furries, musicians, elite gamers, you get the picture. You don't even have to actually be in VR to play the game, as you can probably tell from my footage here. Now we're moving into a different segment here, as the devs of VR chat aren't secretly a cult or anything like that. For this one, there were more allegations of cult activity in-game. I saw two specific names pop up in multiple places listing them as cults, and for this, I'll be taking a look into those claims. There's likely more cults in-game, but these two were names I saw pop up multiple times. The first one I saw, which popped up a few times, was someone named Hypnotist Sappho. This sounded culty enough, so I looked into them. They are seemingly pretty notorious online, so I feel like some people already know of them, but for those that don't, here's what I found. As you can probably guess from the name, Hypnotist Sappho is a VR chat hypnotist who would gather people to do in-game therapeutic hypnosis sessions, and would often post these to YouTube afterwards. That's right. All the way down. All the way down, nice and comfortable. Ooh, you are getting very sneepy. You are going to smash the like button. There's really nothing inherently wrong with this hypnosis stuff. It's, it's a bit weird, but whatever. Though, if you're wondering if it ever went beyond just hypnosis, uh, yes. Yes, it did. Then on September 11th, 2021, Sappho uploaded a video called Coming Out, where they talk about how they are openly a... Uh, a zoo. Hmm. Uh, if you don't know what that is, uh, well, let's just say she really, really, really likes dogs. And from there, it seems everything went even further downhill somehow, and they faced controversy after controversy, a lot involving minors, but at this point, it was, uh, from what I can tell, almost entirely removed from VR chat and more onto Twitter, YouTube, Discord, and private messages. So I'm gonna pretty confidently say that this one isn't a cult, but rather a disgusting person with a cult following of people who agree with their stances. The overwhelming majority of people completely condemned her though, and her actions even resulted in a petition to get her removed from YouTube, which reached almost a thousand signatures. Now that doesn't seem like a lot, but in such a niche community, that's a fair number of people. Again, it seems the allegations of being a cult leader that I saw were just a loose way of describing her cult following. I did see a few tweets that were arguably actually culty from her in years following, like specifically mentioning the word and stuff like wanting to run a compound of like-minded individuals, but again, this doesn't seem to have anything to do with VR chat and were just weird tweets that didn't lead to anything. I want to make it clear that just because I'm not explicitly in detail covering everything they were accused of here doesn't mean I condone or am overlooking their controversies. Uh, far from it. They are a seriously messed up individual. As for the aftermath, their antics with miners and dogs got them banned and run out of pretty much all their frequent spots in VR chat, as well as other VR chat type games from what I've seen. With that said, it's entirely possible that they're still out there simply using a different name. So stay careful out there. Don't get hypnotized. The second one we're going to look at is a group called the Dark Guild, or the Iron Snake Guild, or a few other names as they seem to frequently change it up. This one seems a lot more promising, is based on the guild name. This is a group rather than an individual. Just like the last one, this is a VR chat and VR specific group from what I can tell, and it seems to be run by someone going by the name Alyssa Afton. Now, this is normally the point where I'd start going over what they did, you know, the basics and a general rundown, but the sources on this one are scarce, aside from people discussing them generally on, like, Reddit in a handful of threads. And these are mostly deleted and purged anyways. Also, using Reddit comments as a primary source isn't really something I want to do for one like this. The basics I could scrounge up are that the group's owner was allegedly recruiting people in-game to join their weird Discord, and from there, the main allegations are that the owner would talk to the miners in the server who join in 
not okay ways. And there were some other things too, like occasional threats and stuff like that. It genuinely surprised me that there's pretty much no proper sources or documentation on this one, as it seems like a pretty, a pretty bad scenario. Seemingly, nobody has tried to document it in writing with citations and evidence for accountability's sake. No articles, threads, or videos by major trusted sources, or anything of the sort that I could find. The most there is is a handful of videos by independent creators on the subject, and a bunch of screen caps of Discord mainly. And again, this video isn't cults in Discord, which is where most of their controversies happen, so this one is looking rough. From what I can tell, this is just someone who gained a minuscule amount of power, taking as much advantage of it as possible. Despite the small amount of info on this, I think the overall thing to learn and take from the VR chat ones is to be careful in games like this, as there's plenty of nasty people out there who will do awful things to vulnerable people. My advice would be to DTA. Don't trust anybody. I mentioned earlier that there's probably more cults in VR chat, but I'd wager 99% of those are simply roleplay and completely harmless, with the other 1% being stuff like this. Also, my intention here isn't to scare anyone away from playing VR chat. Just be careful who you interact with, especially if you're younger. I know that sounds like a 90s internet safety PSA, but it's still true. Hey, uh, editing me here. So I was on VR chat for like an hour to get footage, and there is so, so many kids in that game, which honestly just reinforces my stance on this. Now ask over here, what's your age, killer? 15, good. I hop. Sarah, my age is 13, sir. I hop, can I get your age? 12, sir. 12. Seriously, like, be careful out there. As I was researching for this, and especially with the last two, I was reminded of a situation in a different game that was a lot like these. This will be a short little segment because it's not cult related, but it wraps into the whole video. Club Penguin was a children's game operated by Disney that was shut down in 2017. Users could chat, play mini games and just generally hang out. It still had a very dedicated player base in 2017 and as such, numerous private servers were founded in its wake. These were essentially privately run copies of the game with no involvement from Disney whatsoever. Legally, they're illegal. But Disney didn't seem to mind as long as the owners weren't making money from them. Now sadly, one of these private servers, Club Penguin Online, was run by some pretty awful people. The game had next to no moderation, meaning Awful things were being said in the chat, and the owner was accused of many things, all of them being very, very bad things. After these allegations came to light and sort of spread like wildfire online, Disney themselves almost immediately took it down and put out a statement saying that they were, quote, appalled by the allegations of criminal activity and abhorrent behavior on this unauthorized website using the Club Penguin brand for its own purposes, unquote. The aftermath being that the owner was arrested on acronymized Club Penguin charges. Now to connect this to the overall video here, if there ever was a real cult operating within an online game like this that was doing similar things, I highly doubt that the actions taken by the developers would be any less severe than what Disney did with Club Penguin in this case. Developers would very likely heavily crack down on the culprits and at the very least would permanently ban them. There would be articles written about it, videos made about it, and it might even crack the news if it were a big enough situation with police involvement. Luckily, such a thing hasn't happened yet, and I hope it never does. Stay careful on the internet. DTA. My research had seemingly reached its conclusion. After hours of searching, looking through the endless scroll of Google and Bing, scouring pages upon pages of underground forums, and X, formerly known as Twitter, I was somehow without even one singular concrete example of a cult operating within an online game. But then I stumbled across something interesting. There was one, a cult so deranged and underground that I began getting chills as I read through their history. This group, this collective, held their entire game in the palm of their hand, controlling it and molding it from the shadows. The developers themselves were even caught in this iron grip. I started fearing for my own safety 
as I delved into their devious deeds on a mysterious site known as reddit.com, as merely uttering their name may lead to imminent danger. For they are. Launched in 2001, RuneScape is a fantasy MMO and one of the largest games of all time. It's much, much different now than when it launched, even being split into two different versions that are both playable, being RuneScape 3 and Old School RuneScape. There's many, many, many things to do and level in the game. Uh, you got wood shopping, rock mining, people fighting, food farming, and much more. The story we're looking at today happened in 2003, so really early on in RuneScape's lifespan. You see, back in 2003, Cabbage was an entirely worthless item that you could harvest. It didn't pay, didn't do anything, and it didn't even level your farming skill as at the time, that wasn't even a thing. Then one day, out of the blue, a player decided, hey, I'm gonna farm the most useless item in the game. And so he did. The user named Blackbane began harvesting cabbages, quietly, calmly, and without making a scene. Occasionally saying some cabbage-related phrases to pass the time. People on forums picked up on this over time, and by 2004, he wasn't alone. He stated that eventually, so many people were picking cabbages that he had his idea to start his very own group of cabbage harvesters. A cabbage cult. Recruitment began shortly thereafter, with Blackbane only selecting the finest of cabbage pickers. The people not afraid to get their hands dirty in the muck, harvesting for hours on end. New members were being initiated daily, receiving the greeting. We are the Order of the Cabbage, and you have been chosen to join. Welcome. Kabaji. Members donned black robes, chef hats, and red capes, and eventually they went public, allowing anyone to join. And from there, over the next few years, hundreds of new members were recruited. Members came and went. There was infighting, drama, and various power plays all due to the delectable greens. Rival cults formed, cabbage events were held, battles brewed, things were deadly serious in the years to come. There are entire dedicated wikis going over the cult's history, major events, members and guidelines. At one point, a cold war erupted between the Order of the Cabbage and their arch rival, a group of potato farmers headed by their leader, the Dark Messenger. The factions were split upon what was the better crop, with an eventual complete cabbage victory. There's so much documented cabbage lore that it's genuinely too much to cover here. In the coming years, Jagex, RuneScape's developer, added a fair number of in-game references to the Order, mostly with April Fool's updates. Early on, it was just fake blog posts revolving around cabbage shenanigans. That then turned into real, albeit small, cabbage-themed jokes in-game. From what I can tell, though, the biggest addition is that of a cabbage god named Brassica Prime, which even has dialogue. Oh, is is it cabbage? Is a delicious cabbage? And deliciousness is power. That's really all I have time for with this one, though. It's a fun little rabbit hole to go down. I don't actually play RuneScape, so I'm ill-equipped knowledge-wise to properly cover this one, but I thought it was a neat little bit of internet history. And I hope I covered it well enough here in this short segment. But with that one, I can say that technically, by definition here, we have found a cult in an online game.